your people keep on dying world keep on turning cause it won't be too long I'm so darn glad he let me try it again cause my last time on earth Teachers, keep on teaching. Preachers, yeah, keep on preaching. World, keep on turning, cause it won't be too long. So glad that he let me try it again. Cause my last time on earth I lived a whole world of sin. I'm so glad that I know more than I knew then. Gonna keep on trying till I reach the highest ground. Good morning. Welcome to St. Paul's. It's good to see you all today. Uh, if you're a guest today, know you're especially welcome in this place. It's a good day to worship together. Um, and Abby just saying preachers keep on preaching. So if I go long, that's why, okay? Um, I feel like it's a vibe. I just like walked into it. So thank you. Um, a few announcements today. One between worship, Matt, uh, Rabbi Modi Reber will be downstairs. Our serve team has organized him to come and share about the upcoming legislative session. He um, uh, is the leader of Kansas Interfaith Action and advocates um, in interfaith spaces, um, how do people as faith advocate for the social well-being of our community? And so between services, you can go downstairs and um, hear from him and ask questions and um, learn what does it look like for our faith to give voice to um, how we create change and um, care for those around us through policy and so that is between services we also are participating um, with more square the metro organization for racial and economic equity um, uh, writing postcards to our elected officials about health care and um, can care uh, medicaid expansion here in kansas to um, care for those who um who don't have uh, access to health care, um, who, uh, because of the, the place that they fall um, uh, economically. And so there are postcards here in the lobby. We'll also have them downstairs as well. But it's a chance to put our faith into action, to practice justice, um, which is part of who we are at St. Paul's. So we invite you to, um, to be a part of that today. And uh, a few other announcements on February 11th, our new bishop, Bishop Wil David Wilson, um, uh, is being installed. That service is in Topeka at Countryside United Methodist Church at 10 a.m. I'd love to have a great showing um, to uh, welcome Bishop Wilson and, um, and wish him well and, um, and thank him for, for serving in the way that he does. Um, the fifth Sunday of this month is going to be really exciting. Um, we started something new uh, this past summer when there's five Sundays in a month. We combine worship with our traditional service and, um, and have some sort of celebration with that. So this month on the 29th, we are 
going to have a tailgate party after worship, which is going to be super fun. We're going to transform this space into um, a space with soup and chili and cornhole and um, time together. In worship, we will be uh, introducing our new leaders uh, who are serving in the year to come. And uh, we're going to give our third graders their Bibles, and we'll remember our baptisms and the promises we've made in those, and confirmation that Tom Brady will be here. That's the name of our district superintendent here in Kansas City which is hilarious and fun, and, but he's really excited. He asked if he could wear his Tom Brady jersey, and I said, no one will like it, but we'll be kind. <laughs> so, <laughs> so Tom Brady will be here for our tailgate Sunday at the end of the month. Um, he's great. I'm excited for you all to meet him if you haven't yet, um, but it will be uh, a great day. There's some information this week about two different women's retreats that are coming up. So if you're um, a, a woman and would like to uh, be a part of that. You can talk to Pastor Eric and see how you can uh, plug in there. There are um, uh, other announcements. You can see how how to plug in. Don't forget today, Rabbi Modi, after service to um, to connect and um, and put our faith in action in that way. And then today we move into our second Sunday in a series called Lead Like Jesus. We're talking about what it looks like to follow Christ in, in the way that we lead. Leadership as an industry is like a billion dollar uh, company, inter, indus, not company, but industry. Um, there's a lot of people who, who tell us how to lead. And um, we have an amazing example, amazing um, uh, person in Jesus Christ to follow. And so last week we talked about following Jesus as the wounded healer and the authenticity of being who we are, um, that that is who, who, how, who and how uh, Jesus calls us to lead. Today, we're going to focus on a really different role and um, following Jesus and leading like a prophet, um, speaking truth to power, um, standing up for what is right. And so we're so grateful that you're here, so grateful to be in worship together. Let's stand and sing our opening song together. To be like Jesus, this hope possesses me. Please join me in this call to worship. Come to worship this day. Bring with you all your joys and sorrows. Jesus will offer a hope. Come to worship this day, believing in the power of God through Jesus Christ. Jesus will bring us healing. Come to worship this day, feeling the presence of God. Jesus will teach us new ways to live. Amen. worship our King. Come let us bow at His feet. He has done great things. See what our Savior has done. See how His love overcomes. He has done great things. He has done great things. Oh, he 
Amen. You may uh, be seated. (laughs) Will you join me in a time of prayer? God, you have done great things, amazing things, and we are in awe of you. We thank you, God, that you sent Jesus to dwell with us, to show us what love looks like, to speak truth to power and to profess your goodness. As we worship you today, we give thanks for you and for a community where we can experience your love and welcoming spirit. Give us a spirit that seeks you. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.
invite our kids to join me for Kids Connection. We'll meet at the back of the sanctuary and head downstairs with our leaders. Kids through sixth grade are invited to join me. And everyone's invited to sing together, Jesus Loves the Little Children. Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world. Gifts and dignity and worth, you are precious on this earth. Jesus loves the little children of the world. on this earth. Jesus loves the little children of the world. <laughs> Amen. 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 So our scripture today comes from John's gospel, chapter 2, beginning with the 13th verse. Hear these words. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple, he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple with the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jewish leaders then said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jewish leaders then said, this temple has been un under construction for 46 years, and you will raise it up in three days. But he, Jesus, was speaking of the temple of his body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Amen. Will you pray with me? God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of each and every one of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. For God, you are our rock, our strength, and our redeemer. Amen. So... I went to Vanderbilt for divinity school, and I can honestly tell you, I <laughs> didn't know. <laughs> yeah, so did Carter. <laughs> um, and <laughs> I can honestly tell you, I didn't know that much about it when I decided to go there. You know, a full scholarship and the Holy Spirit account for finding my way into that place. And like anyone who has gone to seminary will tell you, and I would guess probably higher education in general, the more I learned the more I realized how much I didn't know about what I thought I knew. But it made for this wonderful three years of walking into discoveries about um, things, you know, probably my super informed classmates already knew to research when they were looking up schools, you know, and um, where they wanted to go. But one of those things was the message that was scrawled on a stone in the courtyard. And that stone can only be described as like a headboard-sized tombstone in the corner where all the leaves would blow and pile up, you know. But it read, behind the leaves, you know, it read, Scola Profitarum. Scola Profitarum. Which I found out was Latin, but mostly I felt like it just spelled out pretentious, Right? But that limestone was weathered and gross. It all just felt old. But that tombstone message in my mind became something I now have. You can see there's a coffee mug. I should have brought it in. It's on my desk um, that has that, that little tombstone message on it. And I use it every day. Um, maybe that's pretentious. <laughs> but um, maybe instead I just fell in love with what I came to know about the Scola Profitarum. 
It means school of the prophets. School of the prophets. It's the tagline for Vanderbilt Divinity School. And that stone looks old because that tagline is old. It's like from the late 1800s. And it's been the guiding ethic for those passing the halls of the school for generations. And I was pretty sure that a prophet was something as old as that tombstone looking sign and had no place in modern life. A prophet, in my mind, was like a fortune teller, crystal ball type person, someone in the Bible who said a lot of warnings about the future. But I learned in my time at the School of Prophetarum, the School of the Prophets, that really a prophet is a truth teller. A person who conveys a message from God and it often looks like truth spoken in the face of power because that message from God that needed conveying most always goes over and against the status quo and the systems that are in place. At Vandy, that that looked like... uh, um, shaping us in a holistic education that included core classes in race and class and gender and sexuality and interreligious study. And we looked at the systems in place as well as theology and history and practical skills. When we graduated, we all spent the time between finals and graduation in media training, learning how to be interviewed by the press should we find ourselves in situations where we are needed to speak up and be a change-making voice with God, the school of the prophets. Now, did that automatically make us great leaders? Absolutely not, right? Did that often make Vandy Div grads unpopular in places, <laughs> like the, you know, the places that like the way things are? Yes, it did. When you learn and are, are formed that sometimes to protest is to pray, that sometimes to write postcards to elected officials is to preach, that sometimes disruption is discipleship, it doesn't sit well. (laughs) I'm almost 10 years out of seminary, and it turns out that's still true sometimes. And on Martin Luther King Jr. weekend, we don't have to look far for the reminder that prophets have been among us being rejected by the status quo for a long time. And they've voiced into being such incredible calls for alignments with God's kingdom that they are somehow timeless and refreshing voices of reason. MLK said that the church must be reminded that it is not the master or the servant of the state, but rather the conscience of the state. It must be the guide and the critic of the state and never its tool. If the church does not recapture its prophetic zeal, it will become an irrelevant social club without moral or spiritual authority. Woof, right? Like that is rough to hear. But Dr. King was a truth teller, a prophet among us. And people were so afraid of his teachings, um, which I believe were so close to the teachings of Jesus that they killed him. Did you see when Barbara Walters died that folks were reminding us that she and Dr. King were born the same year? Imagine how his voice would have continued to adapt and grow if he would have lived to 2023. Wow. But what does it look like to be people who speak to the conscience of society today? I think we look to Jesus, and we look to the glimpses of Jesus, this leader, our leader, that we see around us every day. Our scripture takes place in the temple in Jerusalem, and John's gospel has a little bit different take than the story in the synoptic gospels. And the synoptic gospels are Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they share a a common source, and John's always a little bit different, right? And in the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, um, the story is nestled in Jesus' last week. Okay, so when he is um, the triumphal entry into Jerusalem, he's on his way toward the cross and he comes to the temple and overturns the tables and it's sort of the last straw for the authorities that we could probably point to that disruption is like maybe he should be arrested. Maybe this is, you know, kind of the the turn that takes. Um, And so it's it's at the end of his his ministry in John's gospel. It's in chapter two. 
right? Chapter 2, and we're already having Jesus disrupting the temple. And what that says about how John understands Jesus and his mission is striking. For John, this comes right after Jesus' very first sign or miracle when he turns water into wine at a wedding, right? Now, who isn't a fan of Jesus and John then, right? Like, he does party tricks and public resistance from the beginning. Like, cool guy, right? We wonder why there aren't more, like, millennials and Gen Zers in church when it's like, look at this, Jesus. Like, we got to work on our branding, right? But this difference, this difference in John means there is another reason Jesus gets arrested, right? Later on, Jesus gets arrested in a different reason, you know, his last thing is raising Lazarus from the dead. And so we get, you know, this, this drama of um, death and resurrection, <laughs> right before death and resurrection. Um, and that's all tied together in this gospel. The difference in John also highlights that, um, you know, the, the status quo shifter that John loves so much that, that we can find good things where we don't expect them and not so good things where we do. John does that work a lot. We find good things where we don't expect them, abundance where we don't expect them, and not so good things where we expect abundance and goodness. The temple's a great example of this. Another difference in John highlights from the beginning the conflict Jesus had with the establishment. And we, as modern readers, need to be sure that we also have a, a critical lens of scripture and the way Christian tradition has taken that conflict to then justify anti-Semitism. It's not okay, right? My New, prof new Testament professor was Jewish. She was a prophet for sure, is a prophet, but helped us realize that we don't have to be anti-Jewish to be pro-Jesus. We don't have to make Jews bad to make Jesus good. Nothing is cringier than to do some sort of Old Testament's bad and New Testament is good. And Jesus came to show us that because even in this story where there's turning tables and he has a whip, you know, to clear folks out of the temple, um, the disciples remember <laughs> the Psalms, right? They, they, they pull back this zeal for the heart, whatever. That comes from Psalm, from one of the Psalms in the 60s. I can't remember the number now because that's where my brain is. But, but they're quoting from the Psalms. Like this is informed from, from who Jesus is as a, as a Jewish uh, person born and raised. But that conflict with authorities is real there as is the conflict throughout the, the public ministry of Christ. So we have this cleansing of the temple, and the temple was the place of the, the witness of God. Worship happened there, and religious systems and its practices happened there. And like, um, like they were the, the institution of God's presence. And the pilgrimage festivals that happened weren't always, you know, fully religious duties, but they were still marking the faithfulness of God, you know, because we Christians who live in a country that was projected by the National Retail Federation to spend between 942 and $960 billion on Christmas don't know anything about holidays becoming more than their religious meanings alone, right? But these festivals also marked and remembered God's faithfulness over time. And with Jesus... The incarnation, God with us, was this present faithfulness in real time. And what's difficult about this passage is that something more must have happened than what we can see clearly here. Because when Jesus walks into the temple and gets angry, the temple is pretty much, you know, it seems like everything's okay and as it should be from our reading. He found people selling cattle and sheep and doves, and the money changers were seated at their tables. This is not wrong on its own. The exchange of goods had to happen to give access to animals for livelihood, but also for the life that came through repentance and sacrifices. So while maybe if we just glance at it, we think this exchange is not authorized from the beginning. It very much was. But Jesus can see... What is not always obvious to those of us who are used to the way things are, right? He can see something different here. Maybe hearts were hardened. Maybe it had become solely about profit and not about purpose that it used to have. 
I'm sure none of us have ever wrestled in our own leadership capacity about the outcomes all of a sudden overshadowing the reason we got into the work in the first place. Whatever it is, Jesus sees it, and he cannot let it go. He makes a whip. <laughs> that's, that's one of number also a skill. Like, I don't think you can just, like, do that, but whatever. He makes a whip and drives out operations, right? He poured out the coins of money of the money changers, overturned their tables. So take these things out of here. Stop making my father's house a marketplace. And the leaders question him, what sign can you show us for doing this? They want proof. They want proof throughout the gospel that Jesus has the authority to do what he says and does. And what he says, and in, instead... Uh, he, he just does this beautiful kind of transference when they ask uh, about the authority in the temple. And he, says, and he like does this on the third day, you know, the temple, will whatever, be built. But they, he does this. He's like, my body is a temple. Destroy this temple in three days and I will raise it up. And the scripture says that when he was raised from the dead later, you know, that his disciples thought back to this day when he drove the people from the temple and, and said on the third day, the temple will be raised, they, they believed the words he said. But might they also have been reminded when they thought back to this day that the one who stood up to death also stood up to the injustice in the temple that one day? That the one who showed them later what new life can look like is the one who enacted new life in their religious traditions, in their status quo, in their communal life, who showed them that a whole new system could bring life even when it didn't seem worth the risk to find out. Maybe five years ago or so, I got to go to Washington, D.C., along with a United Methodist young clergy representative from each of the annual conferences in, in the United States. And we were learning about the United Methodist Board of Church and Society, which does um, our social justice work as a denomination. And their building is across the street from, from the Capitol, even <laughs> closer to the Supreme Court building. And we learned about justice initiatives in the United Methodist Church, and we were able to tour the Capitol. And one of the speakers we learned from was Reverend Barry, Barry Black, the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. You might remember him from his prophetic prayer the day after the insurrection. But I remember him for how he sat in a conference room and told us that if we were going to be leaders who created change, we had to, people who, we had to be people who could tell stories to advocate for that change. Always tell stories when advocating for change, he said. Of course, that was the bulk of how Jesus taught. You notice there was only one table flipping instance and then a whole bunch of kindness and miracles and healing and traditional teachings, right? But I think that call for stories, that call for real people, what it brings to mind if we want real change is a good thing. And it makes me think of the real prophetic people in our midst. People like Rabbi Modi, who is here today and has dedicated his life's work to the social welfare of our state through lobbying. His organizing work has made a difference in Kansas, but also a difference in the religious institutions he goes around educating. To be an interfaith organizer is a disrupting change from the silos we often find ourselves in religi religiously, right? And Rabbi Modi reminds us that we can be better together. Rabbi Modi is a prophet. I think about the witness of commercials that always come on this, this weekend of the year. Right? Yesterday, there were commercials of athletes reflecting on the legacy of Dr. King and what he's brought to their lives and the world and the change that has come because of him. And also, speaking truth, <laughs> that racial equity has a long way to go and there is much need for reform in the dismantling of white supremacy. Those athletes telling truth, telling the truth are prophets. I think this week... 
especially uh, about the countless hours congregations like St. Paul's have spent advocating for inclusion of LGBTQ plus people within the United Methodist Church. I think of the letters and the protests and the outrage and the anger. I think of the conversations and the advocacy and the public witness when the powers that be pledged to never budge. This week, Bishop Scott Jones, our Great Plains Bishop two bishops ago, um, he, uh, and he's been a leader in the conservative movement in the United Methodist Church. He left our denomination to join a new hyper-conservative denomination called the Global Methodist Church. He is famous in United Methodist circles for ple pledging to prosecute queer clergy and clergy who perform same-sex marriages. He said, listen, like, months before I came back to serve in the Great Plains, he said, if a hundred clergy stand to officiate a same-sex wedding, there will be a hundred trials. He said, that if, he said that, you know, a few months before I came back from the school of the prophets and came home. And I, I remember a couple years later standing outside in protest as he prosecuted a queer clergy woman who served in Edgerton in my first years of ministry. You can see a, a picture in my office where I kneel in front of him and his hands were placed upon me as he ordained me to the order of elder. And this week, after the persistent prophetic action of churches like St. Paul's, of movements of the Holy Spirit and consistency that we believe our baptismal promises that God's church is open to all people, Bishop Jones decided that the status quo had changed to a place he could no longer be comfortable. And so the bishop who ordained me left, and I can know for sure, <laughs> you know, that he, uh, had he known I was queer, he wouldn't have done it again, you know? And don't get me wrong, I have deep care and love for Bishop Jones. He did very much good for young people in the church. But when the announcement came this week that he was no longer United Methodist, I felt freedom because he was no longer a threat to churches like ours, to people who deserve to have dignity because we are people. Now that change came slowly, <laughs> slowly, really, really slowly. But it was person after person being faithful and choosing to be prophet after prophet to lead that change. You know what our new bishop, Bishop David Wilson, spent his week doing? In his second week of work here as a bishop in general, he marched in Topeka with other leaders to honor Dr. King. He spoke about justice initiatives our conference is part of, and he did so inside of the state capitol. He wrote the Kansas City Star and published his first op-ed as our bishop. And I say first because I believe there's more coming from Bishop Wilson. But he published his first op-ed op as our bishop by advocating for tribal ownership and control of the Shawnee Methodist Mission, the Child Labor Boarding School Methodist Ministry Reverend Thomas Johnson founded, of which so much of our area is named. Bishop Wilson is showing us how to be a prophet. So what does this look like in our own workplaces or in our own context of leadership? What can we do? We can do the right thing, right? We can do the right thing. We can speak up in the right time. We can notice when things as they are are not things as they should be and not have to be a bishop, right, to do so, or Dr. King or the chaplain of the U.S. Senate. What do you know about Jesus that changes how you see things, that changes how you hope toward things? Are there voices not represented in decision-making circles where you've been given a voice? Is there openness to change in the ways things have been in places you care deeply about that you have been closed to? Could you ask for an open heart? 
Maybe it's your HOA or your immediate family. Maybe it's hallway conversations at your job or coaching your kid's team. But whatever it is, the same God who came to be with us and spoke truth to power from the very beginning empowers us and gives us with the same courage and the same peace of heart of continuing that mission. It doesn't mean we get to bulldoze and be jerks, right? It doesn't mean that. Jesus was also sensitive and healing and quiet. But there are times when the tables of who is in and who is out get to be turned. And that is good news. And that is good news, right? That is liberating news that the world can be different. And all can be seen for their worth and their dignity and their gifts as children of God, including you, including me, including our neighbors. So may we raise our voices and speak the truth and journey alongside the leader who was never afraid of being a prophet, but who saw it as a necessary and freeing part of following God in this world. So may we follow his lead and may it be so. In the name of the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer of us all. Amen. Every week, we have a chance to respond to God's word, and we do so through a time of prayer and generosity. We have candle tables in the front and the back of the sanctuary, and we'll invite you to come forward and light a candle. What is on your heart? Um, Maybe light a candle for um, the prophets that you have seen in your life, or for a prayer, God, make me a prophet. Make me brave. Make me courageous in this moment. I also invite us to give generously. When we get to give to God, what um, a status quo changer that is, right? To to give away money, to be generous, um, that makes the world different. And so thank you for being a part of that and for the way that it has shaped and changed lives um, just by giving generously. So let us go to God in prayer and generosity. The light shines in the darkness. In the darkness, the darkness cannot overcome. And the darkness cannot overcome. The light shines. The light shines in the darkness. In the darkness, and the darkness cannot overcome. The darkness cannot overcome. Behold, behold, His kingdom now is come. The valley, oh, the valley will be lifted, will be lifted, and the mountains will be brought down low. And the mountains will be brought down low. The valley, the valley will be lifted, will be lifted, and the mountains will be brought down low. And the mountains will be brought down low. Behold, behold, His kingdom now is come. Hear the voice cry from the highway. highway. Make way for the Prince of Peace. Make way for the Prince of Peace. Hear the voice cry from the highway. highway. Won't you make way for the Prince of Peace? Won't you make way for the Prince of Peace? Behold, behold, his kingdom now is come. God of justice, God of justice righteous, judge. righteous judge, behold, 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 our defender, our defender Prince, of peace. Prince of Peace, behold, 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 Father to the fatherless, Father to the fatherless, the deliverer, deliverer. behold, Trouble in the water, water. marching marching through. Behold, behold, his kingdom now is come. 
Amen. Well, what a gift it is to gather at this table uh, each week. Um, Jesus said uh, that my body is the temple, and then says that we become Jesus' body, and that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. And so I pray as we come to this table that we receive this gift and that we are, um, as we consume, we are consumed Uh, by the zeal, uh, the heart uh, of Jesus. So let's come together at this table. We give thanks to you, O God. Uh, It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks. For you are almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. Before the mountains were brought forth or you formed the earth from everlasting to everlasting, you alone are God. You created light out of darkness. You brought forth life on the earth. You formed us in your image. You breathed into us the very breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, spoke to us as a prophet and through your prophets. And so we join with all the your company and and the prophets who have gone before us. And and we pray, giving thanks to you. We recognize how in your baptism and in table fellowship, Jesus, you you took your place with sinners. You, your spirit anointed you to preach good news to the poor and release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind. That the time had finally come when you had set at liberty all who are oppressed and save your people. And so it's by the baptism of of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection that God gave birth to us, the church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. And on the night that Jesus gave himself to the end for us, suffering because he was such a prophet of love to the end, he gave thanks and broke the bread and shared it with his friends and said, take, eat. This is my body. It's given for you. Do this and remember me. In the same way, after supper, Jesus took the cup and raised it in a blessing and again shared it with his friends at that table and said, drink of this, all of you. This cup is a new covenant in my blood poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this and every time you drink it, remember me. And so God, we do, we remember you. We offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us gone before. We ask that you pour out your Holy Spirit. Pour out your Holy Spirit on we who are gathered here on these gifts of bread and cup. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we would be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your spirit make us one. Make us one with Christ, one with one another, one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast forever at his heavenly banquet. Through your son, Jesus Christ, with your Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory belongs to you. Almighty God, now and forever. And so learning to be your body, learning to be your temple, learning to be your kids, we pray as Jesus taught us saying, our father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Friends, it's really important that we say, All are welcome at this table, and we don't just say it, 
And we try and knock down any barriers to access that would keep that from happening. And so know that whoever you are, wherever you've been, whatever your age or stage, this table and this meal are for you. I pray you receive a gift of grace as you come. go ahead and stand and sing this final song with us. I stand before you now The greatness of your renown I have heard of the majesty
crashes over me, crashes over me, for you are for us, you are not against us, champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in. I have heard you calling my name. I have heard the song of love that you sing. Oh, so I will let you draw me out beyond the shore into your grace. Oh, Crashes over me, crashes over me, for you are for us, you are not against us, champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in. You Crashes over me, crashes over me, for you are for us, you are not against us, champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter as your Crashes over me, crashes over me, for you are for us, you are not against us, champion of heaven, you made a way for all to enter in. Reminder, Rabbi Modi is downstairs ready to welcome you and share about the uh, upcoming legislative session and how we as people of faith can advocate for the social well-being of our neighbors. And so you can head downstairs. There's also a table in the lobby if you don't have that much time to write uh, postcards along with uh, more squared and, um, and do that. And you can drop them in because we know if you put them in your bag, you're not going to do it, right? <laughs> I know that. So let's do it in the hall or in the in the lobby before you leave. But as we go from this place, may the love of God and the grace of Jesus Christ, the power of the Holy Spirit go with us now and always that we might all be students in the school of Prophetarum. Go in peace and be a prophet. Amen. Amen. As your love in wave after wave crashes over me crashes over me for you are for us you are not against us champion of heaven you made a way for all to enter as 
Champion. 